Ever since the war started in Ukraine, Ukraine has been asking for one thing and one thing only. MGM-140 attackums. But tanks and IFVs are in a strong second place. First, a little disclaimer. I am not military personnel. I am not a military analyst. I don't work in defense. All this should be taken as is the incoherent rambling of a 23 year old on Twitter. Yes, I am ripping Perun's concept of go sue me. Yes, I am aware of the state of Belgian military aid to Ukraine. Yes, I am just as ashamed and angry at the Belgian state for letting it get to this point as you are. Now, first of all, what this video is not going to be. I am not going to talk about the viability of main battle tanks and infantry fighting vehicles in the modern, inf in the modern battlefield. Both military history visualized and the chieftain have already discussed this topic at length and even Perun made his own video on it. So why am I making this video and what actually is it? Well, first of all, it was going to start off as a deep dive into why everyone is constantly talking about it being Germany's responsibility that they must supply Ukraine with their tanks. Something I've never really understood because do we really want to give Ukraine Leopard 1s? Even if they are Leopard 1A5s because we have so much better stuff. So then the video kind of evolved into me taking a look at what European and American stockpiles actually had in them and what the most viable platforms would be to supply to Ukraine. Also, don't worry, I just have Julian included here because I want to make fun of him for believing that the Abrams claim by CJ is real. He still has not deleted this tweet as of time of recording. So let us just quickly take a look at what Ukraine both is capable of in its sustainment and logistics, and what Ukraine actually wants. So first of all, let us not forget that Ukraine is a state at war. Its military is not free to just do whatever. It is really hard to retrain units on new platforms when they are stuck in a trench getting shelled. Then there is Ukraine's logistical situation. Pre-war it was already not that great. Just by the sheer diversity of platforms they had in service, especially in their MREPs and infantry mobility vehicles, though far from as bad as Egypt. But it, by this point it is really getting to that. Where they are getting an eclectic mix of pretty much 10 of everything. For this we are going to have to ask ourselves, what about ammunition? What about spare parts? What about consumables? Then there is Ukraine's lack in proper maintenance personnel and maintenance facilities. Its largest maintenance facility, the Kharkiv tractor plant, no longer exists. And its most well-equipped maintenance facility in the Kiev Oblast got hit by a Russian cruise missile after mainstream media really decided they had to go and film it. Well done, mainstream media. However, not everything is doom and gloom on this front. Ukraine is able, is capable of getting B-72s repaired in Europe. It has been sending about 30 tanks over the border into Europe for repairs every single month. Which means they are getting 30 tanks back into service every month as long as Europe is capable of maintaining these. But now, what does Ukraine want for the future? Well, Ukraine wants, and this is by the article co-written by their commander-in-chief, whose name I'm not even going to try and pronounce, called Prospects for Running a Military Campaign in 2023, Ukraine's Perspective, in which he states Ukraine's desire to fully raise 
10 to 20 new maneuver brigades completely equipped with NATO standard gear. Now for anyone that doesn't really know what a brigade looks like in the Ukrainian context, here we have a lovely graphic made by Battle Order. And it shows you that a Ukrainian mechanized brigade is made up out of three mechanized battalions, one tank battalion, one to two motorized battalion, an artillery group, an air defense group, a recon company, a sniper company, and then all of its support assets. For what I was able to find number on, numbers on, this unit needs 40 main battle tanks, between 90 and 120 infantry fighting vehicles and armored personnel carriers, 60 to 80 mine resisted ambush protected infantry mobility vehicles or just transports, 36 towed or self propelled artillery pieces, and 18 multiple launch rocket systems. If we meet Ukraine halfway and say we can supply 15 brigades, then this is the amount of equipment we are going to have to find. This is more equipment than the German army actually has. So let us just now just quick take a quick little look at platform availability over all of NATO. And bringing forward the obvious suspects with their military balance 2021 figures, this is all pre-war. We see that the largest tank force in Poland yeah, the largest tank force, not in Poland, no. the largest tank force in Europe is owned by Poland. France, the UK and Germany combined don't even match the total Polish inventory. But even if we were to combine Germany, UK and France with Poland, we would still not get anywhere near the colossal that is the United States. 2,500 tanks in active service, 3,700 tanks in storage, and these are all M1A1 Abrams or better. They decommissioned all of their M60s even from storage. In terms of armored personnel carriers, we have about 10,500 in active service and about 8,000 in storage. The, storage, the stored ones are mainly M113s, but still better than nothing. Still better than nothing. Just to drive this point a little bit home, the sheer difference between Germany and the United States is just ridiculous. And yet it is Germany that is the one that should be providing Ukraine with all their tanks even though they only have 245 in active service and 78 in storage. And even worse, of those 78 in storage, at least 29 have already been earmarked for delivery to Slovakia and Czechia to backfill their inventories of stuff they donated to Ukraine, that being BMP-1s and T-72s. But then you say, Jeff, what about all of Europe combined? Not just Germany, all Leopard 2 users in Europe. All Leopard 2 users in Europe come to a combined 1,979 vehicles in service and 194 in storage. Now this is a little bit misleading as Spain doesn't list their 2A force as in storage while they are, but that's a topic for a different time. And then we again just have to compare to US stockpiles. And it's it's not even a contest. And this is assuming that all of these Leopard 2 users are actually willing to supply their vehicles to Ukraine. Switzerland and Austria are not in a million years going to provide even a single bullet to Ukraine. Turkey and Greece, on the other hand, are starting to basically put the knife to each other's throat. 
Meanwhile, Finland and Sweden might not really be willing to start give up stuff now that Russia is making a lot of military threats to them. So this availability for Leopard 2s in Europe just keeps decreasing. But then you tell me what about Rheinmetall? What about Rheinmetall? Yes indeed. Rheinmetall has since the start of the war been extremely vocal about willing about their willingness to sell gear to Ukraine. Not donate, sell. So what do they actually have in inventory? Well, about 200 Martyr 1s, of which only 16 by their own admission are operational. Of which 40 are very likely already going to Greece. Because Greece signed it, because Greece reached an agreement, not signed, reached an agreement with the German government to exchange 40 Martyr 1s for 40 BMP 1s. So those BMPs can go to Ukraine. Meanwhile, there's also about a hundred Leopard 1A5s in storage. We only really know that it's a hundred because that's the highest quantity that was offered to Poland. So my question at this point is going to be if there is only 16 operational Martyr 1s and no operational Leopard 1A5s, why should we bother? Providing small amounts of a single platform is just going to make Ukraine's logistics worse. And their maintenance situation even worse. So at that point, I start to have 3 a.m. shower thoughts. And these should be taken as complete speculation, not based in near, they are not at all based in reality. So, Rheinmetall being as vocal as they are about these platforms and their willingness to sell these to Ukraine must come from somewhere. And my belief is that this comes from them either being able to get the government concessions out of selling these at a steep discount, or they are selling these at a stupidly high markup. Again, I have nothing to prove this. Rheinmetall has been fully silent about this. Joltz has not said a thing, only that he's not going to only that he's not agreeing with their sale. So speculation remains speculation. So lastly, what my video actually wants to propose. Because of course I am not going to talk about a problem without providing a proposal because that would be whining. A possible solution would to be to stop looking at this at a country by country basis. Let's look at this from a collective NATO. Let us all agree on a platform of which the availability is there. Collectively as NATO finance that product finance that platform for Ukraine and collectively as NATO support and maintain that platform. Stop doing things piecemeal country by country. This is not a dick measuring contest. Start working together is basically what I want to give with it's basically what I want to say with this video. Start working together as NATO, pick a platform, probably M113 or something. Buy a shit ton of them. Collectively as NATO by just going around with a donation hat. And then everyone who still can maintain M113s takes up the burden of repairing and maintaining them. Because there are a lot of people in Europe left that can maintain and repair M113s. So, depending on the feedback I'll be getting on this video, more to follow of course. I will keep updating my military assistance for Ukraine list. I have 
also made a little change on that on the German list specifically, where I've started marking everything that Germany bought from industry in red. But for now, that's going to be all of it. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you guys later. I'll see you guys another time.